big overestimators, some are big underestimators. So is it a problem with them figuring out how much time they need? And then there's also, obviously, can they do the task? So if you're talking about, well, I just need them to sit and do their homework, but they didn't even have a system in place for getting the homework written down, your whole system is going to fail. So that's what I mean by structuring and scaffolding. You're taking one task that's important, breaking it down into all of its pieces, and figuring out where your child is struggling. Now, one of the things that you want to be really careful about, actually, let me see if it's this back on the next slide, um, is, is not worrying about shoulds. Well, my child should be able to do homework on their own, and so why am I going to praise them if the only thing they did well was write it down in their planner? Well, actually, what we know is that positive reinforcements are much more effective than getting upset with them, having consequences for not doing it. So you sort of have to throw that out the window. Maybe all of your friends or neighbors, their kids are doing their homework. What you're looking at is where on that scaffold is your child, what step are they able to do, reinforcing and praising that, and then moving up to the next step slowly. So if you just sort of think about structure and scaffolding in terms of tasks, that can be helpful. This is another topic I talk about with parents all the time. You don't want to yell or rely solely on consequences. Um, now, that being said, I'm a mom of two boys, too. Do I ever yell at my kids? I'm an East Coaster. I talk loud and fast. Absolutely, I do. What you want to do is check in with yourself, though, and see, is that happening all the time, or was it sort of a bad moment for me, a bad day? And you can even model that for your kids. I'm sorry I yelled, super tired, was up late last night practicing my talk, or whatever it might be. Um, but let's try and communicate about that in a better way. So your goal is not to yell. What your goal is, is to say yes to both their emotions, but also to your expectations. The words that I use for this all the time are compassion and boundaries. If you can keep those ideas in mind, compassion and boundaries, compassion and boundaries. What we know is that if you set boundaries for your child, if you put all these rules in place and child who struggles with executive dysfunction, we know we want to set everything up and structure for them, but you're not compassionate, they will not be able to tolerate those boundaries. The flip is also true. We often hear parents saying, but their executive functions are terrible, they can't do this, they can't pay attention, I just need to do it for them and be understanding. And what we know if you are just compassionate is that as this child gets older and older, they're going to struggle more and more. So that sweet spot is really right in the middle. Your goal is to be teaching your child, right? So you want to be supportive and kind, understanding when you say, you know, I, I need you to stay seated at that Thanksgiving table for 15 minutes and they get upset. You can say, I know it is upsetting. And you really wanted to be on video games the whole time. But my rule is that you have to sit for 15 minutes or at least until everyone finishes their turkey. Set your rule, decide in advance, be compassionate, be compassionate to them. So those are the big parts for parents. It seems like that's it. Well, it's obviously it's complicated because you're having to decide um, what you're going to work on, what's important, how do you break it down, how do you communicate effectively with compassion and boundaries. So there's a lot of individual work that goes into this with parents and either working with one of our great executive coaches in the community or um, working with other professionals, psychologists, who can help support is going to be key for many families. This next piece is, is focused in on the, the children and their daily routine. Right, so if we pull together, what are key issues that the kids need to pay attention to? Diet. I'm going to say this a couple of times over. Don't overlook the obvious. Do encourage a healthy diet. What I mean by that is encouraging things like protein and complex carbs in the morning. Again, a lot of research to support that if you give them something sugary, a donut, they're going to get that dopamine rush really quick. Then they're going to crash, and their executive functions are going to be poor. 
But you also don't have to beat yourself up. It would be lovely if every morning we got up and made a you know, egg white omelet with tomatoes and cheese and some meat and some vegetables. Even the difference between something like oatmeal versus a sugar cereal is going to have an impact. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it just has to help to support them. The flip is also true, though. There's not a lot of research to support that eliminating things like sugar, dairy, and gluten can be helpful. For some people, this can be a little bit beneficial, but what you do find for most kids, you take these items out, they still show executive dysfunction. Um, and with medication, sometimes parents worry about that. They don't get enough calories if their diet, if they're not hungry midday, but certainly that's something that can be very effectively uh, remediated by more food in the morning and later in the day. One last point about um, the sugar and the diet and what people with, or kids with executive dysfunction in attention are drawn to, especially teens. What you find is that a lot of people self-medicate, so they're drawn to sodas, for example, like a Coke or a, a Sprite or something along those lines because that sugar does give them a dopamine rush. We know that sugar gives us a dopamine rush and the caffeine to help stay focused. So those are sort of unregulated ways of, um, of supporting their executive dysfunction if they don't have a strong system in place. So optimism. Don't equate executive dysfunction and the behavior that follows with laziness. This is sort of a persistent myth um, and as parents, it's hard when your child isn't doing the things that you want them to do to think they're just being lazy. Because what we know, as we spoke about earlier, is that their brains are different and it's harder for them to do many of these tasks. So instead, what you really want to do is try and encourage optimism in them. What are ways to do this? You know, you'd, you'd be surprised that they're just 20 minutes a day of a parent connecting with a child, 20 minutes, can dramatically improve a relationship. There's an entire actually field in child psychology that is focused on this. It's very small amounts. We don't have to you know, spend all of Saturday at Elitch Gardens having 20 minutes of doing something enjoyable together. By doing these things, by improving um, your relationship, by focusing on the positive growth that they're making on that scaffold, even if it's a very small step in the right direction, you're improving their self-esteem and ultimately decreasing chances of associated anxiety and depression. And that's one of the big goals here. Finally, exercise as, as one of those key sort of everyday issues for kids. Again, don't overlook the obvious. You do want to encourage physical activity. Exercise is what we call a do no harm intervention. When we exercise, just like eating sugar, it releases dopamine in our brain. Dopamine helps with executive functions. So that is something that is very useful to do and really there aren't many side effects to exercising or other sorts of physical activity. One important point though is to really think about your kid um, some kids who have attention and executive difficulties do perfectly fine on team sports. Many don't. They might have all the skill to play soccer, but you put them in the middle of the field when they're needing to divide their attention, inhibit running after their ball because they feel like their teammate is not doing as good of a job. All of those things become very difficult. So really thinking about doing an individual versus team sport can be important for kids. Um, and finally, sleep. Again, don't overlook the obvious, but encourage adequate sleep. I put up the um, ranges that we expect for kids here. Um, you know, one of the things that we know with kids who have attention and executive difficulties is that they often have trouble falling asleep at night. The flip side is also true. If kids aren't sleeping, their attention and executive difficulties look worse. So when we're doing evaluations, if we hear that a child has significant sleep difficulties and a parent is questioning if they have ADHD, we often want to see that sleep improve first to know if there is residual difficulty with attention and executive difficulties. Given that kids with um, ADHD or executive dysfunction have trouble shutting down their brain, it's 
not much more important to make sure that electronics are gone at night. I know this is a battle sort of across the ages, especially um, in adolescence. This is one of those um, factors that you might want to put on your scaffold in terms of setting some pretty clear rules about making sure that electronics are turned off for two reasons. One is that blue light, which keeps people awake. You have that blue light coming in. The other is just the speed of information on electronic devices makes it difficult for the brain to shut down at night. What we know is that exhausted neurons, quite literally, our neurons function more slowly when we are tired. And you can see decreased concentration, decreased problem solving, slower reaction times. In fact, in some studies, they looked at adolescents who were sleep deprived, and they tested the same on driving simulators as people who were legally drunk. That's how important sleep is. It's a huge factor that we want to encourage in our kids. All right, so we went through the first two sections. The final, really thinking about this takes a village to focus on your child. Um, one key to keep in mind is that when you're thinking about all of this, as I mentioned earlier, it really needs to be individualized. This isn't a one-size-fits-all model. You need to individualize your plan, thinking about your child in your family, at his or her school, in his or her activities, and what's coming up for him or her in the near future. We really do want to avoid thinking too far out in the future. That tends to make us as parents just more anxious. Focusing on the near future. What might be important in my family in terms of being organized or how homework gets done is not necessarily going to be the same as someone else's family. So as you're building that scaffold, thinking about what you want your child to work on, it's really taking some time to think about what's important for your <coughs> child or what your child needs to work on. And finally, this team approach can be key. It's complicated. You don't want to go it alone. Rather, creating a team for you and for your child. So this involves, obviously, the parent who's taking care of the child or other primary caregiver, as well as other people who are helping. When we talk about setting up that scaffold, building um, the way that you respond to your child with compassion and boundaries, it's really important to have discussions with these, about these topics with other people who are with your child often. We have some families that I've uh, worked with recently where the grandparents and the parents were on very different pages, and the grandparents were actually with the children quite a bit. So you can imagine what that's like for the child where the rule is constantly changing. That's hard for any child, but a child who has executive dysfunction, it's going to be even more dysregulated. So we talked about uh, pediatric neuropsychologists or clinical psychologists in terms of assessment. Um, if you're looking to go down the medication pathway, psychiatrist or pediatrician perhaps, as we talked about getting support for you and or your child through executive function coaches or psychotherapists, um, and finally communication with the school, both leadership as well as the individual teachers. And sort of the bad news here is it really does come down to the parents. You can find different professionals. Sometimes you have professionals who are great at communicating with everyone. Sometimes they aren't. They might be really skilled, but that's not what they're going to be doing is spending a lot of time communicating. So one of your most important roles is going to be making sure that this whole team is communicating, understanding when things are or aren't working. Mm -hmm. So you know, how do you treat executive functions? This sort of 20-minute take-home talk on that is remembering easy does it. Thinking about educating yourself, assessing your child, structure and scaffolding. What do you need to set up for your child to be effective in his or her daily life? Making sure that you're both compassionate but setting very clear boundaries. All of these daily activities, diet, optimism, exercise, and sleep, and then involving everyone who is working with your child on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll take some questions if anyone has. Um, I was wondering if you have found or if there's any evidence supporting any um, effective and long-lasting strategies to improve working memory. That's a little bit of a sensitive question. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I suspect you might have heard something called CogMed. Is that so? Um, the, the early research on that was incredibly promising. It was being used all well, not all over the world, but in a lot of parts of the world. And um, I've certainly heard from colleagues who've used it that for some kids it was it was beneficial for some things. But the the early claims and the ongoing claims have been that it is. Um, really effective across a, a wide range of things like reading comprehension and math, and those claims have not held up as well. So I, I don't want to give it a, a blanket thumbs down. I, I absolutely think that there are some situations and some children um, that, that would benefit from the structure of it and the repetition of it, and, um, but there is also something called the Hawthorne effect, which a lot of folks don't know about. It's sort of the behavioral equivalent of the placebo effect. And what that is, is when you pay attention to something and really focus on something with a, an adult or a child, it gets better for a while. It really, like sitting down with it and focusing on it and paying attention to it is good for it um, to assist to some extent if it's a positive intervention. Uh, but it doesn't always equate to long-lasting changes in games. So um, I would say, you know, beware of that toddler effect that you might get some short-term benefits and you might get a lot of positive testimonials based on short-term effects that may or may not create quite as much broad-based, long-lasting change as people would like it to. But I, I wouldn't, I sort of wouldn't rule it out, um, but I would, I would consult pretty carefully before engaging in that. And as far as I know right now, there is no other intervention for working memory um, that we could identify or recommend. So not, not a specific recommendation. So that's the one piece I wanted to add when you're thinking about a program like a COGMED, which for those who don't know, it's a computerized program to work on working memory. Those types of programs, you tend to see benefit in the specific area that you're working on on the computer. So if you test that again, working memory will look better in that area. But the key that's missing often is the term that we use of generalization. What you want to see, and this is where coming up with these skills at home and working with you know, executive function coaches, psychologists, different people, can be really helpful is because um, children with executive dysfunction struggle more than the typical child to generalize skills. This is also true in the learning disabilities realm. So they might learn a skill in one area, and it's hard for them because they're not using that top-down processing to think about but what do I already know about this? Or how can I apply this in a different way? That's hard. So that's where coaches or parents want to help the child to actually have those conversations. Remember when we worked on X, Y, or Z? Well, this is the same. You have to also have to plan out in advance, and you are starting to make those links for them, whereas sort of prescribed programs don't tend to do that as well. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it just it doesn't hold up in the research, um, and so that's the angle that we tend to take in terms of when we talk about recommendations for patients. I think Dr. Powell and I are pretty similar here. What we like to focus on is what we know works, right? So we know that families working with executive function coaches who are well trained, and that's it issue is going to someone who has expertise in this area, the same thing as you know, getting an evaluation from someone who has expertise in this area. And a parent recently asked me about an evaluation, just sent me an email, um, just wanting to get some advice and was wondering about a whole slew of people. And I said, well, most of these people aren't pediatric, so that would be my first concern. It's so just focusing in on what we know works, people who are educated in these areas, um, those are the recommendations that tend to make. Uh, it's a little bit of that do-no-harm concept. If we know it works, it's not likely to be harmful. I actually want to just add one piece, since, since you mentioned brain balance. I don't want to um, you know, speak directly to any particular program, but, but what I want to say is that a lot of programs like that, um, that, are, that are nationally based and, and bigger, and if, if they are advertising to you that they, are, they, can, they can address and treat ADHD, autism, all learning disabilities, and every developmental disorder under the sun using their patented approach, be suspicious. 
because um, what they're saying is they can treat anything with the same collection of three or four interventions. And even though it's individualized, um, these are very different conditions and children vary tremendously with these different um, conditions. And so they oftentimes make reference to research in their, in their advertising. And that research is essentially research saying that the brain is plastic and can change. It's no more specific than that, where it, where it says, you know, if you do this one thing, it will help with one thing. But the claims are generally a lot bigger. And if the claims are really big, I would be somewhat skeptical and, and ask a lot of questions about how, just how they're going to do that. Um, yeah, so executive functioning coaches are big business right now. And a lot of what's happening is there are psychologists that are saying, well, you know, my particular program is superior to the others because of this, this, this. And then they give you their research that a lot of times they pay for. And you're becoming this researcher in of yourself. And it's really not very regulated yet. So I know you said you didn't want to speak to any one program, but with all the EF coaches out there, how do we decide who to select? I think really one of the most important things to look at is their background and training. There are different programs. I mean, even the couple that I mentioned earlier, um, who are groups that I refer to based on years of experience and having worked with them and sent different children to them, different families to them, their approaches are different, but they have a very strong background in understanding executive functions, in understanding development, and understanding education. So that first thing that you're probably looking for is their background in education. Because there are many people who are new into the field who say, oh, me, I'm going to be an executive function coach. And they don't have any background in it at all. And so that would be someone that I might recommend to a patient who might not be the path that you want to go down. In terms of then deciding within well-educated, background and become well recommended, it in part comes down to an assessment if that's helpful. So again, I will sometimes recommend different families and different people based on a particular child or family's need. So if you're able to get an evaluation to understand your child's needs or your family's needs, then that professional who you're working with should be very well educated about the people who you need. Thank you. 
There are herbal medicines that you can use. There are various things that we can do as long as you're doing what you know works. If it's not impactful in terms of time, so your child is miserable going because they can't go to any of the fun activities that actually boost their self-esteem uh, because now they're doing some of these alternative things and they're doing the things that we know work. So my recommendation would always be we want to do what we know works. If you have the time, the money, your child feels good about doing some alternative things and there's no evidence that it's harmful, then that's okay, but we want to start with what we know works. So 
it's hard to, die, to evaluate true executive skills in a five-year-old, because we don't expect them to be an executive yet. We, we, parents are the prosthetic frontal lobes in the little 